Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Javar Gile uh, from Timberwolves. Uh, so we are really honored to have him as part of the Minnesota Robotics Seminar Series. Is their vice president of sports science and performance. So you see automation, sensing, robotics are coming into, into NBA. So he was director of uh, athletic performance for the Houston Rockets. And he has uh, more than 20 years of experience in the industry. Uh, interestingly, he's pursuing his PhD in health science from Rush University. And he has an MS in human movement from A.T. Steele University and completed his bachelor's degree at the Po. So he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, training, which is based on augmented reality and how this improves sports performance. Javar, I hope I didn't butcher your name. You can butcher my last name as well. No, Welcome. it's right on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. I, you know, this is a, an exciting time. Um, you know, obviously, it would be great to I'm actually in a theater right now, uh, where we would typically be uh, presenting uh, in our facility at the Mayo Clinic, but um, I'm glad to be on great for grateful for technology uh, to bring us together like this. Hopefully we can, uh, you know, meet in person and do these things in person soon. Um, but yeah, so uh, over the last 20 years, just been, uh, I've worked in strength and conditioning, worked in uh, sports science, and really, you know, at the higher level or at the higher levels of sport competition, I think what we've come to find out is that these highly trained athletes uh, aren't always the most successful. Um, so the sporting outcomes basically is, uh, is, is what I've gotten to is that it's not really solely determined by motor performance. So the better athletes aren't necessarily the most successful. Uh, as you see here with James Harden, the environment's constantly changing. Uh, he's, he might practice that same move, but the scenario uh, time and time again, but the scenario is, is always different. So the environment is always changing. So how do we train for that? Um, th this athlete that you're, that you're looking at particularly, you know, I've, I've had a, a great opportunity to work with him over six years. He is not the, and, and he's okay with me saying this, he's not the most gifted athletically and he knows this, but he is able to process things. He's able to see things quicker, uh, faster than, than most. So what makes him look explosive in this particular move against a guy who's a lot quicker than he is, is really because he's his, his uh, cognitive skills. So um, I think that we need to integrate the brain, the body, uh, and the environment, uh, and the environment. So, uh, AR technology is just one tool that, uh, we're, we're looking into, uh, more that that's more advanced and, and hopefully we can bring into, uh, and onto the quarter field, uh, wherever we are training at. So, uh, that's the goal is we want to immerse the user into a more realistic, uh, dynamic, dynamic environment. So there are a wide array of cognitive training tools, in techniques uh, that have been used in an effort to create, uh, you know, this positive transfer, but I really think that their efficacy is is suspect. So we want to get better, uh, and and we want to develop a, a better evidence-based tool, uh, and that's where uh, you you all come in is to help us do this. All right, so. Okay, so just to give you a little brief overview, um, again, as uh, Doc said, it's, I have 20 years of experience in sports science and performance. Uh, I was with the Detroit Tigers for 14 years in baseball. This is where it all started. Uh, just, you know, in, in that game, it's all about anticipation. Um, again, the most physically gifted athletes in baseball are not the, the best uh, and most successful ones on the field. So it started there and, and it, it moved into um, six years with the Houston Rockets in their, uh, in their organization as a director of athletic performance. 
uh, in sports science. And then now I've moved into a VP role uh, with the Timberwolves. Uh, and this is my first year with the Timberwolves as VP. So I'd like to, you know, basically share my experiences uh, and my philosophies and really bridge the gap between the, the brain and the body and, and physical performance. So my emphasis of practice has been on neurocognitive, how do, you know, neurocognitive training, how do we implement um, tools that improve uh, the communication process between the brain and, and uh, the action, the behavior. And, and then I've had a huge emphasis, um, you know, done a lot with biomechanics. So uh, if you talk about philosophy, my philosophy is really, there's, it's a blend of all different philosophies. It's not solely focused on one thing. Um, and, you know, I think, in order to do so, you have to surround yourself around the best tools, around the best uh, people. And so that's been my philosophy and how I operate over the years. Um, so the pur purpose today is really just, you know, how do we do this together? And, and to get everyone here thinking, how do we bridge the gap? How do we develop the strategic partnership in research and development where we can create this, this really cool tool that we can use on the court uh, in our field um, and this is where my, you know, full disclosure, this is where uh, my focus is going to be for my dissertation and research uh, for my PhD. So, uh, you know, defining agility, you know, these agile athletes just make movement look easy. And that's, that's really what it's all about. So what it's not about is the force, velocity, and power curve completely, right? And that's what we, as sports science athletic development uh, practitioners, that's what we focus on is, is we look at those force curves, we use force plates, but it's gotta be more than that. Um, and so we wanna create that optimal environment uh, to train the brain. All right, so if, you know, there isn't a lot of neurocognitive research out there. So we, we really, try to do a lot of stuff uh, in the biomechanical world, motion capture. Uh, here you look at Chris Paul, you know, some of the things we do in the lab uh, regarding uh, movement and uh, just, you know, performance training and assessments. Uh, there isn't really a lot out there when it comes to neurocognitive uh, in sport. And so, you know, I think for us, the focus would be to involve something that would involve, you know, the, the college age athlete, 18 to 22 years old, uh, may focus on one sport and may focus on multiple sports. Um, but, you know, I think when you look at the few things that are out there, uh, Powers and Fisher back in 2010, uh, they used transcranial magnetic stimulation and they found a relationship between brain activity and biomechanical changes. And, and so from there, the stimulation um, that was provided the transcranial stimulation uh, reduced cortical motor excitability uh, of the glute max. And so it ended up resulting in better jump performance. Um, you know, but there, there's a lot of limitations when it comes to these studies. Um, you know, I think we could tighten up our studies in, in the future. Uh, you know, a lot of these studies don't examine, uh, you know, the entire or all brain regions. So I think you know, there's a lot to be taken into account when it comes to, to neural adaptations. Uh, this study was also not performed in a sports specific setting. It's, it's, it was performed in a lab, just like you see here. Uh, and, and so it, it's cool that, you know, we can work on landing mechanics in the lab, but if it doesn't transfer into the game and landing mechanics are poor in the game, then it really doesn't make a difference. So I think the further investigation we do need to assess the neuroplasticity in a real game-like scenario uh, you know, even using wireless transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation type devices in conjunction with an augmented reality device, uh, I think would be valuable. Uh, and, you know, just recently, uh, there has been uh, some improvements or, or I think people are starting to see and recognize that there is a need for future research. I, I just think the population is small. Uh, you know, so Grooms had a, a, a virtual reality study uh, that explored neuroplasticity in sport, um, but they just used four uh, female college soccer players in their study. But it, it was promising uh, where they found that motor, motor cortex activity, uh, you know, did reduce hip 
adduction and knee valgus in jumping t uh, uh, tasks. So I think there's some promising evidence that's, that's shown some trends that we can use to help drive what we're doing in the future. Uh, but I think the key is to dis distinguish between the mechanisms that cause uh, these changes in behavior. Is it central or is it peripheral adaptations? All right, so we got a busy slide here. I just wanted to kind of show you the things that we have done in the past. Uh, we've been doing neurocognitive training. Uh, I've been in incorporating, especially since baseball, when it, it just has uh, a huge transfer. You know, we started with vision training. And then we moved to more complex neuromuscular, uh, uh, neurocognitive uh, training tools. So here in this first little video, um, we how do we incorporate it now? It's we incorporate it in the weight room in in exercise. I'm huge on multitasking. So how can we perform what is a typical exercise we might do for core stability, but involve the brain somehow? <laughs> you know, so let's. Let's, it's still a little too simple, but let's at least involve the brain somehow and, and incorporate some reactive component to our training. In our assessment, uh, you see some things that are related to like Stroop test type protocols, uh, go, no go, uh, just simple reaction time measurements. Um, so, you know, in this other video, this is one of the assessments that we might do and then continue to train and then reassess. Uh, again, the problem here is that some of these tasks are just too simple. So when we are looking to transfer onto the court, this isn't necessarily transferring to the court. We're actually just training the brain. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to see if, if other aspects, if we do these types of uh, training, do these um, particular um, aspects of uh, neurocognitive performance improve. Uh, so, you know, in this case, simply, uh, you know, can we improve uh, some sort of recognition, anticipation, things like that? Because we know that reaction time isn't going to improve, you know, in, in these these athletes as opposed to us. Is there's going to be no difference in the actual reaction time? But how do we improve anticipation? How do we improve their processing? How do we reduce error? Those are the things that we're trying to uh, see if we can improve. Um, but again, like I said, it's too simple. Okay, so we have gotten into some some uh, you know more complex tasks that include processing speed, include executive function, um, uh, attention, uh, pattern recognition. These are the things that are really valuable to the athlete, uh, and what gives them the ability to to perform at a high level consistently. And so there are some, some uh, other more advanced tools. What you guys are looking at here is Synoptech. Uh, it, it was a company that really started with Nike uh, in, in vision training, in their vision training segment. They, they decided to stop that um, performance segment uh, a few years ago and Synoptech came about. Synoptech is probably, uh, in my opinion, one of the better neurocognitive uh, vision training tools out there right now on the market. Can we ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So do you do eye tracking and you do monitoring in, in the synaptic basically? No. So there's no, in this case, there's no eye tracking um, in the synaptic. Uh, you know, there's some other tools we've looked at that we just haven't invested in uh, to be honest, because I'm, I'm not big on the one-time use type thing and in the two-time use type thing. So um, while there's really cool, I'd, I'd rather partner with someone to provide those types of tools. Um, the stuff that we use and in, in when we prioritize our expenditures, we want to be able to use it in training. So um, it, it, we don't have any solution that isn't a cost-effective solution right now uh, that might involves some eye tracking uh, software. So I, you know, the virtual, the things I have looked at would involve like the headsets with the virtual reality. It's just, to me, I, I spend my money elsewhere, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, those are uh, different. Those are, you know, you put them under the screen and they monitor basically your eyes to see right. how well you are following. Yeah. The, the other question I have is for the body motion. 
uh, you know, uh, these days with the computer vision, you are able to uh, track your body really well and you can compare your poses to different ideal poses. Is that some kind of an interest that you can uh, basically have a couple of cameras that can track that body motion when they do these exercises? Yes. And so... Uh, just for instance, postural sway would be a huge would be important for me to measure in in terms of uh, stability and things like that. But a more accurate way. So we've had tools that you can even use on your phone, almost like a level that can kind of record your postural sway. But yes, I, I think using motion capture, using uh, accelerometry, uh, and more advanced methods would be helpful. Where we can uh, even in these these more complex tasks. If we, if we test and then we train, if we can improve their, their motion or in some cases, their stability and lack of motion uh, in certain tasks, we know that the training stimulus is, is working, right? So I think that's what we would want to be able to do and we can do uh, you know, with, with your help, especially is being able to put them in an environment, measure, you know, like in this case, in that first video that you're looking at, you know, that we're able in this, you know, we're trying to prevent movement here. And so if we can track that, and then especially under fatigue, uh, be able to put a number to it, I think anything that we can do that's more data driven is uh, beneficial. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, you know, in, in right now, you uh, with this assessment you're looking at, this is a CNS vital signs. This is something we've used in the past. Uh, talking about some things that are cost efficient, but you know, one offs. We 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 might do a pre and post, but it, it's it's spread out over six months, and and we can see if anything we're doing is is effective uh, from a neurocognitive uh, perspective. But this is what we want to measure, and this is what we want to show improves in our athletes. Uh, everything from in the in especially the the more complex things that involve executive function. So, uh, athletes are really good at pattern recognition. Um, they're really good at at pro like the the good athletes are really good at processing information quickly, but also being able to do it in a uh, way where their response is is not filled with errors. Right. So. Uh, the, the guys, the, the athletes that perform well in these assessments, you will see will have less turnovers uh, in games. And so this is just the anecdotal evidence. This is the stuff that we have had data on that is not published because we, we NBA, you know, so there's restrictions. And, and so we would have to go through a whole, uh, uh, you know, we would have to go through the MBA to get some of these things, but these are things that the public doesn't see um, and that we're, we're starting to see. So we're, we're basically, it's driving the direction we want to go because we know it, it, it's effective, but we want to find a better tool um, to train it. So uh, the, the, this bottom video, uh, this is a, a great, uh, we use this with all of our athletes. Uh, prior to a game. And so we're actually getting an assessment. This does correlate to fatigue. Um, so guys perform uh, poorly when they're more fatigued. Uh, so we have found that uh, to be true, but this is a perceptual training game that they might play. Uh, again, this is done pregame. We do this every game. Uh, one of the games that we play every game, and then we do a multiple object tracking, uh, which they enjoy as well. Uh, but the the better at the 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 athletes that perform well out on the the uh, field or the court perform better in these tasks. It's tough to train these as well. So are you looking to automate the uh, the process of the evaluation? So what? So I think the missing component here is putting this type of environment into uh, bring this environment onto the court. So the only way you train and improve these skills is to be put in this situation. It's the 10,000 hours of practice rule. So how can we create, how can we blend the real world, the real game scenario with uh, 
the virtual world? And, and I think one of the answers might be in this augmented slash mixed reality world. And this is where we're trying to bridge that gap between what is available now, and then you take this and you bring it out on the court. Well, there's only so many game scenarios you can present with, without 10, you know, in, in the case of basketball, without 10 people on the court. So how do we create this environment? And I think starting simply is, can we put a basketball in someone's hand? Can we put a soccer ball on the ground and have them dribble and, and take on this ever-changing agility course? Now, it could be a fixed environment. It could be um, an open or a closed environment. Uh, it depends on you know the, the training effect that we would want to do. So I think we have these open and closed um, agility training environments and some are random, some are fixed. And so I think that's what we would tr try to replicate, um, you know, using uh, smart glasses, using uh, mixed reality. Okay, so like I said, I think, you know, from a neurocognitive perspective, uh, there, there are tools that are out there. Um, here is the big screens that we're using now. Uh, this is a video actually of Jarvis Landry. He's a football player uh, using the same system. Um, but again, just how can we create this? Right now, you watch him. Like, what is he training? He's training hand speed. It's a physical exercise. The, you know, I think that's really the key, right? But if now you can actually have a football coming at him, in this case, you're just, he's seeing his quarterback throw the football, right? You know, it's, it's more of a visualization thing. How can we create this visualization into uh, improving their behaviors in the accuracy of, of what they're doing out on the field? And so, you know, I think blending the two and really getting into a more complex scenario. This is cool, this looks cool. I think it's too simple. Uh, it provides a cognitive load, but we need to imp we need to enhance the cognitive load uh, and really make the environment, uh, you know, game specific. But this is fun. The athletes have fun doing it. Um, you know, I think they do show improvements here. But I think the question that we need to answer is: how, Do these improvements shown here transfer to the field, to the court? Uh, and that's where I think you know, the, the research is, is uh, scarce. I, 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 and it's, it's, you know, how do we prove that? And I think we need to, to develop uh, that sort of tool. Okay, so taking it one step further, you know, how do we develop this tool? So here, here's is, this is some cognitive load going on here. We're like, we're not measuring it, obviously, but you are multitasking. Well, this is what's going on in the court. You have to do a lot of different things. In this particular drill, you know, and this is what happens. He loses the ball, right? But in this particular drill, we'll, we're telling him when to switch hands, right? And so he has to stop what he's doing. He has to make a decision on when to do it and process and not turn the ball over. There's a lot of different things going on. So this is what we're trying to create. But in an actual environment where he's, he's moving, and, and that's what the, I think the AR, that's what I think uh, mixed reality, I think smart glasses offers is we can actually get them moving in this environment and create the same sort of training effect. Uh, you know, there's, the, uh, you know, you guys have the cave system. And so I think the military has proven what a great system that is uh, to put people in the, the real environment, right? Um, and, and train them and, and how it's, improved. Uh, I think there's a study out there that just the visual and the haptic feedback that the cave system provided in rowing improved, uh, you know, rowing skills. So I think there's efficacy to things like cave, but can we bring this to the court? Can we make it more affordable? Can we bring it to this athlete right here, uh, Chris Clemens, who uh, isn't on the court with nine other players all the time? but can get this training in the comfort of his own home or, or even in the weight room, right? Cause I think, you know, again, it's, it's, we're training in the weight room, 
things are transferring to physical performance. They're getting more powerful. They're getting more explosive. We're reducing the likelihood of injury, but it's not necessarily transferring to their basketball skill, to their sports specific skill. And then we can even go as deep into how it can help the general population as well. Um, you know, the elderly reacting to a car that they have to avoid uh, quickly, uh, you know, and, and hop back onto a curb, uh, a curb. So just again, thinking outside the box on, on how we do this and really just impact the world. Uh, so I think the missing link is, uh, you know, very intelligent, uh, innovative people like yourself. And um, I think I was told when I was first getting started 20 years ago, I was told by a coach, it was an internship. The only thing I remember in this internship was what this coach told me. And he said, if you want to be the best, you have to surround yourself around the best. And I think uh, it can't be done alone. I think it's, it's really a strategic blend uh, of, of minds and resources. And I, I think that's where, uh, you know, you in the university of Minnesota can help us improve what we do in our environment. So I appreciate everything. I think again, it, the, the vision is to bridge the gap. Uh, this is, you know, me doing it in a, in a, I, I hope you, you don't get sick uh, and dizzy watching this, this uh, video, but I mean, this is what we're really trying to do in its simplest terms, right? If we could just create a yellow dot that comes in, in the, some, some glasses, right? And then we have to react to it on the court and then finish with a layup. Or we have to dribble a ball and then pass it uh, with our feet, uh, as in soccer. That's what James Harden is good at. And that's what we wanna train to improve. And that's what's not out there right now. Uh, so it's, it's some strategic research and development that's needed. Uh, it's us coming together and creating that type of tool. And, and really, we would revolutionize uh, the way we practice uh, in this environment uh, and really give, you know, I think some, some younger uh, athletes um, the opportunity to, uh, you know, train anywhere and, and really develop their skills uh, with more purposeful practice. So that's it on my end. I appreciate it. And I'd love to, to answer questions. Uh, and I mean, really just hear what you guys think of, of this and, and what am I missing? Where, where, where should we go from here? So thank you very much. Uh, questions. So I have a question. I mean, wouldn't it be interesting to kind of monitor all these players to see how well they are doing and then compare it to some kind of an ideal movement that a person with less fatigue can do? So it, it can so can you repeat what what's what's the question I mean the, again? The, you, you have the video of the players uh, playing and mm -hmm. you might have an ideal movement for the person uh, doing you know the, the uh, playing for example mm -hmm. and the question is that wouldn't it be interesting to kind of monitor each player and then uh, track his motion and mm -hmm. assess how well his motion is being how well he is doing uh, compared to an ideal movement. Yep. Yeah. And, and then detect fatigue, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we do that in various ways, um, in our environment. So, so we have two things we have one on the court, we have, um, we have motion capture accelerometry that's measuring their, their movement on the court. Now that doesn't necessarily assess the biomechanical component. So then we do have motion capture, uh, and then obviously the kinetic um, measurement tools uh, that we will uh, utilize in our assessments there. Um, and so I think now we, so we can train to improve the efficiency of the movement. We can train to improve the quickness or the, the you know, the rate, you know, when it comes to completing a task uh, more quickly, I think 
what we're trying to replicate is the environment that's ever changing, right? So they're not, can they then transfer this movement that they've become more explosive and put it in a random scenario? And that's what isn't trained. So, you know, again, you know, you look at James Harden right here, what he's doing has been practiced over and over and over again. But the, the, the environment again is, is changing. So how can he, that, that move, he might, he might go left every time, but it's always different. And so how do we put them into an environment? Because any, I could do all the training in the world in the weight room. Uh, it'll make him quicker, but it's not going to help him uh, make better decisions and improve that behavior when you have a defender on you and you're told to go left. It's just a matter of, you know, it's just that split second uh, reactive ability. And really, how can we address the electromechanical delay uh, that's occurring in, in these physical tasks? So let me, uh, let me uh, say what I understand. So basically you are talking about a, a mixed reality system where you can have a, the player physically immersed in the, into a cave environment and basically create a virtual re reality video of an avatar of James, of James Harden where the, uh, the two players can basically um, face each other and try, and try to, to go on ahead on one another, right? So that we can see whether the avatar of James Harden can be successfully defeated by by a player by a physical player is that what you're talking about yeah so from a you know from a just what i envision i'm i'm thinking you know we're trying to with smart glasses create this this mixed reality augmented reality world where uh instead of me as a training as a trainer if I, if I tell someone to go right or a light lights up and I'm told to go right, um, in this scenario, carrying a basket, you know, you're dribbling a basketball or in a soccer scenario, you're dribbling a soccer ball. You have multiple things going on. So you have, you know, in this particular video, you might have movement of, you have to make a decision on whether to pass, whether to drive, in this case, whether to shoot or whether to, to pass to the guy in the corner. So there's a lot of different things going on. So you have two defenders in this particular case, you have one right here, and then you're presented with another one right there and you have to make a decision and be accurate in your decision, not to turn the ball over. He has to make this shot. So how do we create this environment where if I am the person dribbling the ball, if I am in this case, James Harden, that I'm presented this environment virtually as I'm dribbling the ball and I'm able to interact with the basket. And so that's what we don't have right now is can I do this on the court? Virtual reality, you know, so for instance, uh, with the Rockets, we did virtual reality, which turned, which turned into visualization, right? So we would have a guy, uh, we wanted a guy to improve their free throw shooting and he actually did improve his free throws. Do we know, was it just practice? What we don't know is, was it just, the physical practice that improved his skills, which it probably was, but we also did visualization with him and we did it with virtual reality. So we put cameras on him uh, and then we put it into the, the virtual uh, reality headset. And so he would watch himself shoot these free throws as if, you know, in his head moving and he could see if he looks down, he's dribbling the ball. When he looks up, he sees the rim. And we, we asked him to, when he's sitting there on his couch doing this, we asked him to actually go through the act of, of shooting and make it realistic, but he didn't necessarily have the ball. So that's, that, that's great, but you can't do that with virtual reality actually shooting the ball. So what the augmented reality, what the virtual reality, uh, what the mixed reality will do is allow us to get on the court and perform these actions with an actual ball where they have to, I mean, it's just, instead of having this game environment, you're bringing the game environment to you, uh, which will allow you more practice repetitions. 
you know, in training, because again, again, the, the game and, and getting nine other players on the court is difficult to do. Okay. Thank you. You know, and, and when, and when we're talking about like, you know, how we're trying to do it, does not necessarily, we, we need it just the stimulus, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a holographic image of, I think that's what we're going to see in the future of, a, a, you know, a person coming at you, but, uh, you know, like this video showed on, on the right here is, is, you know, it could be a dot, right? And, and, we, we, and we could create a, a simple solution of, you know, go instructions, right? Go right when it's green, go left when it's red, go when it's green, don't go when it's red. And we can create this, this list of rules. Uh, and that's what's missing in, uh, you know, in our training environments now. Okay. Javar, it looks like Will Durfee has a question. Yeah, great. Th thanks. Javier. That, that was a really fascinating talk. I'm Will Durfee from mechanical engineering and work in medical devices and rehab therapies. So, so in as, as you know, I'm sure for uh, stroke rehab, there's been 20 years of research in AR and VR and uh, combined with TMS or ESTEM or all kinds of things in order to uh, restore motor function for um, stroke. And, and while, of course, the movements are not as complex and the environment's not as complex, I'm wondering if any of the research from that whole field has informed the way that you're thinking about doing this uh, training for elite athletes. Yeah, I think that's where it's stemming from is we could actually utilize this to improve efficiency of movement. Um, I think that's where um, it's shown. And then, you know, with stroke uh, victims, you're really getting a, a chance to really see how, you know, how the brain can, can rehabilitate, right? So I think there, there's a lot to be learned from that aspect. I think in healthy populations, it has been used um, with you know, just the physical aspects of things to improve their, their uh, motor function. And, uh, and then again, it's looking at motor cortex and how that applies to like the neural adaptations that are being uh, made to improve, again, if it's, if it's single leg um, function in a single leg jump task or something like that, you know, that it is able to improve their efficiency of movement. So we've we know that it can help in that aspect. So now how do we kind of blend that to, in this case, we would want to put them in this motion capture, this virtual, uh, with the, the glasses on to see how this training actually applies to, you know, the, the physical and separated from the cognitive. Where are the improvements? Is it, is it a neural adaptation? Is it uh, just the peripheral adaptation that's going on? I think that's where we would want to investigate a little more is, where, what is actually improving, um, you know, how is, how are we improving this task when we involve a, another stimulus? Yep. And a, and a lot of that has been, you know, examined in the case of stroke rehab and the idea of, you know, putting on goggles in the mixed reality environments mm -hmm. and, and so on. And while, again, it's, you know, a different environment, perhaps some of the principles from, you know, that kind of, uh, those studies might, you know, direct the sorts of things that you're thinking about for, for these athletes. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, the, the, what is missing, I think from is, I mean, that's all we have to go by right now uh, because there's nothing out there from a sports specific environment other than how it translates into um, some of these physical tasks, like improving a single leg squat. Um, improving physical performance, um, but um, nothing that involves basically the, the purpose of this is to, how does neurocognitive training improve physical performance in a sports specific skill? There's nothing out there, you know? So I think um, these ideas and, the, and how we come up with the procedures is really gonna rely heavily on um, that existing research out there. So there is a question um, from Ross. 
Is there any direct correlation between the scores on this agility test and any hard typical performance metrics like successful uh, success in free throws or other metrics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in our, you know, in over the years, just using the CNS vital signs as the assessment tool, um, we've the, and this is unpublished, this is strictly confidential <laughs> stuff that we're not, we're not able to publish, but um, so the processing speed, executive function, um, and I'll tell you that, you know, guys who, who score highly are guys like James Harden. Um, those things, I think the, the biggest thing we've seen is the errors, right? So uh, the errors in decision-making translate into turnover. So that, that was the biggest relationship that we've seen so far, but um, from an overall performance standpoint and what separates the really good athletes, just anecdotally, is their overall neurocognitive score in that um, seen as vital signs uh, had a lot to do with, with their performance on the court. So, I have a few questions myself. So one of the things I was wondering, how do the players react to this technology? I mean, uh, because I think about, I was thinking, for example, in high school, uh, I don't think some of these tools are used. Am I right? That these tools, these yeah. in high school? Yeah. yeah. No, I, they have some things now that are apps that are a little bit more inexpensive. Uh, some of the things that you saw, um, uh, I think the, the one particular one was uh, where the guy was doing the actual exercise and just doing a reaction time. Those are apps. They're, they're just not very affordable to the, to those athletes. So the school would have to invest in it, but um, the synoptic software is expensive. Uh, the whole setup, that we have is fairly expensive. So uh, it, the, there's not much being used at the high school level other than some, what ends up being the visual training devices, right? That, that are just working on simple reaction time uh, along with movement, right? So it's not very complex. So how do they react when they go, let's say to, uh, higher levels or professional teams, do they see this as a valuable addition or they say, oh, you know, it's just, uh, I need to do bench exercises and that's yeah. all. So, so for the basketball player, they see this is more beneficial than uh, the weight room. <laughs> now, I wish, it, I kind of wish it was a little bit it flipped right now because, um, no, they absolutely do see the benefit of it, um, and then they enjoy it. I think in the in the synoptic um, software we use, they just get really into the games. I think it's they, they, the these young athletes now. They love games. They love a challenge. Um, so when it be, when it started out where we were doing just kind of reaction time training, go no go type thing, they would get bored with it. I think these more advanced uh, drills that we're doing a little bit more complex they get they get into so the one you saw um, that they do pregame uh, they get the, you know they're asking to do it pregame they're like oh you know so it's the last thing they do they do they jump on the force plate uh, they do some um, you know obviously in their warm-ups they do s some physical activity uh, but they're always ending with this neurocognitive uh, tool and really to me right now it's just Let's activate the brain and, and um, coordinate that with the body and and really just it's an activation technique for me. But they get really into it. They have fun doing it. They get competitive with it. Um, we incorporate this this big board that you see the big screen. Uh, we have that on the court. And so during practices, we'll incorporate that into our warm ups. Um, so they get they get into that, I think they see the results, they see a number. So anything that you can provide data, these athletes are getting into, uh, they're competitive with it. So it's actually a lot of fun and they really enjoy uh, doing it. And that cutting edge technology that, you know, the, the glasses, it, it, you could put this in an environment where they could use it on the court, 
So what I didn't show you the strobe glasses that we use, but currently we're using that come, it's, it's a piece of the synoptic training. Um, they're called strobe glasses. So they, they have shutters and they, they shutter and they create this environment where, um, you know, basically you can change it. You could have one eye off, one eye on, you could change the shutter speed and you actually have to do a task while these shutters are, are going on and off. And uh, we incorporate those glasses on the court. So during practice, and so it's been a part of their practice, they're trained for it um, and they enjoy it and they see how it can transfer because they have the tool that they're, they need to use in the game, they have that in hand. So I think, again, that's where the transfer occurs. The weight room, the guys can be as strong as they, they you know, the, the strongest guys, the most, you know, we, we test combine at the NBA, we test the, uh, at the NBA combine, we test these athletes for years now. The best performers in the NBA combine, the best performers at the NFL combine are not, they don't make it. <laughs> you know, there's a needle in a haystack that makes it a LeBron James, um, you know, a Russell Westbrook. Uh, you know, these athletes are not necessarily, uh, aside from them, most of these athletes like James Harden are not the most explosive. They're, they have, uh, you know, a few weaknesses in their athletic skills. So what separates them from the rest? Some of these great athletes out there, why are they, they're, they're, they get away with it. They're, they succeed because they're physically gifted, but what is limiting them from being, uh, you know, the, the, the top of the line, the upper echelon is the lack of their, uh, you know, their, the neurocognitive component. So it's, it's really interesting, but um, I think personally, the, the glasses on the court would uh, be very exciting to these athletes. So I have another question. How do these transfer, let's say to soccer? Soccer is, is interesting because also is a field anticipation. I mean, you need to look at the field you need to so are you aware of similar training systems for soccer or uh, or there are specific sports that are benefit for this or the yeah, type of no. training right um yeah no there's there's at this point in time that i'm aware of uh so they've created some 2D type atmospheres where you can do some agility, um, you know, some agility training, you know, looking at, you know, a flat screen like that behind me. Um, you know, we, we developed, uh, when I was with the Houston Rockets, I had a custom treadmill made that was nine feet wide by, by uh, 12 feet long that they could dribble a basketball on. And then we would create an environment um, where they had to react to what we were doing. And that was maybe throwing a, a cue out there for them to dribble left or right. Um, but it was, it, the, the treadmill was constantly moving so we could create some repetitions. Um, as far as a environment like this, you know, in, in soccer, it's, it's really, it's the same. It would be the same type of environment, uh, except obviously they're dribbling with their foot. And I think, you know, you would create, the, the same environment, um, again, where they have to, you know, with the glasses, which isn't offered anywhere that I know of, um, this is what we would have to develop, right? Is this augmented reality environment where they, it's really just putting them in a natural environment uh, without changing much uh, where they can do these tasks. You know, I, I use an example in soccer because you have to have this visual awareness and, and dribble a ball, have this uh, peripheral vision and this uh, acuity, this dexterity that's involved in dribbling, but then also see your defenders as you were, you're alluding to. So some of these environments we put them in don't offer that. And I think that's where the glasses come in is that it can offer that same environment where they, it's not really messing with the natural environment that they would be in uh, when they're practicing out on the field. Let me jump in here. Um, uh, I'm a little bit familiar with the MLS 
program, um, in particular the referee side. Uh, and one thing that they do there is um, they, are, they are not doing the advanced stuff that you are talking about, uh, Jaffer, but they're they are looking at uh, individual uh, planning for each person, a, a customized type of series of training uh, that's maybe different from player to player or from referee to referee based on their ability and their needs. For example, if we take out of the court uh, James here, who is very successful in this uh, move, uh, and we put Yanni, let's say, uh, he may accomplish the same thing that he did to, sc to score, but he may make a different move. Right. Uh, so the, the problem here is that not what tools we need to present them to, to do the training, whether it's you know physical or, or virtual reality or whatever, but what can we do a reverse engineering of the mind of James or Yanni of what it is that they processed and, and what pattern recognition did they accomplish temporarily uh, since the, the, the environment was the same? Let's say everything's the same except we change the player with the ball. Mm -hmm. Everything is the same. So they do a, a different situation awareness uh, recognition and they act according to their strengths and abilities. Yes. Right. So how do we reverse engineer that? And would that be applicable to the new player that you would train? That, that's, that's a key problem. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's why I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I mean, there's that. So James, again, James Harden in this particular move, he practices this same exact, that, that sequence is practice thousands and thousands of times over the last several years. That same exact sequence, the, the, the amount of dribbles that he takes, that whole sequence is practice. I've watched him, follow him around overseas for six years. That same move is practice every time. How, how does he choose when to do it? And then again, at that moment that he shoots the ball, he is actually processing whether he should throw it to the corner or finish. And it depends on what the defender does. So he is going off of what the defender does. He's able to recognize it much quicker than anybody else. And that's what makes him good at, at, at what he does. And so, you know, Giannis, James, what is what allows them to recognize these patterns quicker than anybody else? And how do we train that uh, more effectively? Uh, because you know, the environment it, in the weight room isn't going to work. Right. And what makes it more difficult is that they, most of them, don't know how they do it. They just do it. It's, <laughs> it's, exactly. it's the syndrome of the expert. I mean, an expert draws a straight line from the problem to the solution, and then they get there uh, somehow, and they just don't know how they did it. Yep. So getting that information out of them so you can implement that in some, into some kind of a tool is a very difficult problem. That's one. And the other problem is that it may not work for the other player. Right. So we have the fundamental problem of discovering what are the uh, axioms of the neuroscience that build up the ability of a player to do real-time situation awareness and act accordingly to accomplish a mission. In other words, get the ball into the, the basket or into the net in soccer. Mm -hmm. And so I would come back with the question, uh, if, if, if we had a, a, if you created a skill, I don't know what, what you call it, almost like a skill combine that it re required decision making, anticipatory skills, nothing like more than just a physical activity, right? How do you how would you train, how would you assess that and, you know, create almost a, the same environment, but then assess w what the differences are between good and bad performance? I think it's almost like trying to, to build a new branch of mathematics. You come up with a set of axioms and then based on these axioms, you build theorems and, and people prove a theorem with different methods. 
using the same axioms. So what are the fundamental primitives in physical training and uh, new neuroscience that if uh, this minimum set was to be understood and trained for all players, they could then pick and choose during real time what they can, what they need to do to accomplish the mission at the end. Mm -hmm. How do we discover that? I think there is a lot of, uh, there are many different directions for, uh, where this discussion can go. So any more questions? So Javar, again, we're really grateful for your uh, very, very interesting and exciting presentation. And um, I plan to try to meet you in person at the beginning of March. So we will be in touch. It sounds great. No, I look forward to it. I appreciate everyone's time. Yeah, please ask uh, any any questions if you, if you have any. Hopefully uh, you did find this interesting and uh, it's just, a, it's an honor to, to be in front of you and, and hopefully we can uh, again uh, talk shop in person soon.